Welcome everyone to yet another episode of Disruption Talks. Just as we promised last Tuesday, every Tuesday, you're going to see us and hear us on your favorite social media or podcasts. So at Disruption Talks, we invite top experts to discuss digital acceleration, winning strategies, innovation, and scaling products. And today joining us is Rebecca Wares from Wise, something that you could have known as TransferWise. Now it's Wise. Welcome, Rebecca. Hello. Great to have you. So um, let's dive right in. Let's begin with who is Rebecca. I'm looking at your LinkedIn. I'm seeing a previous digital agency to right now a product oriented, one of the leading fintech companies. So as the principal product designer at WISE, please tell us who is Rebecca in the sense also of how you came to be Rebecca that we're interviewing today with the position at WISE. Yeah, um, so I think I was always a bit creative um, and I knew very early on that this web, des back then it was web design career uh, would be something that I wanted to do. So I think when I was 14, I started teaching myself how to code because I seen all these cool blogs and I wanted to have one myself. So I did that after school, just coding, CSS, HTML, that type of stuff, very easy. Um, and then I obviously needed the graphics to go with that. So then I convinced my parents to buy me a um, Photoshop license. And then, yeah, that just, that was even more fun than the coding part. So um, I stuck with that since I was 14, 15, and, and then Googled if this can be a career, and I found out it was a career. Uh, and then, yeah, I just... I was just really relaxed in school because I knew that this is what I want to do. Um, and then studied communication design. Uh, so very visual background um, and then worked at Sapient right after. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it does, does sound like a very visual introduction into, into product design because it, it isn't always the case nowadays, right? It's not necessarily that you would begin with, for example, Adobe Photoshop. And yes, that's true. Back in the day, you were buying a license, not a subscription. So yes, that, 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 was, the, that was the original way. Um, so now we know a little bit about Rebecca. We know how the career path was created, um, the roots of your journey, um, and... Right now, like I said, you're in a product company, and before you were in a digital agency, which is much more of a service-oriented kind of business. So what would you say was the key differences? Is it that you jumped ship because you prefer a product environment, or is it just comparing apples to oranges? Tell me more. I think, um, I mean, I, I generally don't think it's that much different. Um, and I find it very funny when product orgs decline agency folks because they don't have enough valid or um, experience. Because um, I think the main difference to an agency environment is obviously <clears throat> as a designer, in terms of your craft, there's constant competition um, within the agency. You, there's always someone that has better ideas, that is a better designer, someone that's louder in the room, and you kind of in an agency, you definitely learn to find your feet and see how you can personally stand out from, from the crowd. Um, that doesn't mean you have to be the loudest in the room, by the way. Um, that can be through many other things. And then also in an agency, what you learn is how to communicate your ideas. Given that agencies, their bread and butter is selling ideas, so they get hired. Um, so I think that's maybe the big difference that you really learn that skill. So not just the UX and finding the best solution to the customer, but also um, communicating the value of your work to people that are not in the industry, that don't have that context um, and, and make them buy your ideas basically. And then also, I guess, um, the nature of agency is you have a project for six months and then you move on to the next one and the next one. So within six months time, you have to not only ship the perfect end product for the client because they pay for it, you also have to learn about a different industry, so automotive. And then the next six months you, you work on a retail client. So it's always something else and you have to just become an expert very, very fast and connect the dots in the right way so that you can then ship something that's meaningful for 
your clients, customers. I think these are the, the three differences to working within product. Um, but I think um, they are not exclusive to each other. Sure. I'm, I'm, I'm making notes of what you're saying, especially the things that I like the most. And uh, it, it sounds like basically the advice would be try yourself out in a, in a service environment. And then when you jump ship to a product environment, you're uh, sort of well equipped with all of those men, things that you mentioned, like selling your ideas, communicating the value of your work to people outside yeah. of your your bubble, so to say, because, of course, between designers, product designers, you can easily speak the same language. But when it comes to a client, especially from those changing uh, industries, it just uh, it's a it's a baptism of fire. One might call yeah. it that. Right. Um, so. Would you say that the, I mean, what I'm hearing from the service environment is that you have to be a Swiss knife kind of person, right? So one man arm. Uh, in this case, what would you compare it to being a product designer? Uh, do you also have to be a Swiss Army knife? Do you also have to utilize the same competencies that you have from the service environment? I think, yeah, that's why I said earlier as well, I think they're not that different. And that's why I find it so funny when you get rejected as an agency person in the product world. Both both types of designers are Swiss Army knives in a way, just that maybe um, in product, the, the skills are more on the iterative approach, right? And, and sort of just under, becoming really an expert in what the company you're working in. So, and why is this like finance and, and um, yeah, I guess, sorry, what was, can you repeat the question? Uh, I'm trying to understand what is the challenge pretty much. Yeah, uh, the challenge, yeah. The, the, the challenge that's endemic to the product person, product designer, because I can imagine there is the benefit of you are located in the FinTech industry. So you don't have to context switch that much. So the, the Swiss army knife has to have less uh, knives within it, but yeah. I'm imagining they have to be much more specialized, which is to say that come might have, might come with specific challenges just to, to this type of job. So yeah. I'm curious to learn what are the challenges, if any, maybe it's a perfect job with no challenges and how do you overcome them? Yeah, I think um, the challenges are just, that in product, so at WISE, for example, you really need to deeply understand your customers' needs um, because you don't want them to drop off because something broke in the experience. Whereas as an agency person, I think you, you do care about the customer outcome as well, especially when you're coming from a digital agency, it's not a marketing agency. So um, you do need to create products that are valuable to the end customer, otherwise you're not getting hired again. Um, but yeah, as I said, the challenges are just, you spend more time in agency talking about the value of the work and then delivering the work. And in product, you need to deliver constantly and constant improvements and iterations and monitoring. So it's just a bit of a shift in terms of workflow um, and expectations, because there's not like the six month timeline and the budget approved and the time dedicated to ship something in its entirety. Uh, it's more incremental and therefore it gives more room to experimentation and innovation as well. And I think, and you can move faster overall um, with your product. Yeah, I mean, it does sound like uh, those six month marathon sprints, call it what you want. Uh they they are finite right so yes. um, unlike in the product environment the job is, is never done you never sort of say this is complete there's nothing else that can be done uh yeah. so i'm getting that and speaking of uh the the workflow um i wanted to talk about wise's uh external public accountability i'm talking about the published mission roadmap uh mm -hmm. this is actually something that's a growing trend across companies, across products, across uh, startups, across investors, just publicly pronouncing their goals and where they are in terms of where they want to meet them. Even I've seen startups doing this in a very clever way. Instead of just reaching out to investors, they would publicly showcase that we have the metrics were X, now they're 1.5X, and simply 
not only was it uh, a show off kind of attempt, like look at us, we're doing this, but also making sure that if you put it out in the open, there's no way like, if you if you don't follow up on this or if you don't continue showing that, I mean, you know, the, the shame spiral and the inefficiencies just uh, just encroach. So Wise is one of those companies that is proud and open to show what they're aiming for. Uh, and what is the biggest of them all that you have for 2022 in the mission roadmap? Um, I think the the biggest one that has been communicated or keeps being communicated is that we keep improving our mission to go towards zero fees, right? We keep improving our speed for transfers. We keep lowering our fees um, and keep making our product available to more customers around the world. And I think that's why Wise is such a great company, um, that they they stay true to their mission um, and, and keep improving and are also very transparent. I think when you watch some of the videos that recap sort of each quarter, we're also very transparent where maybe we lowered fees, but then maybe we had to um, increase some fees in other countries or in other products because of x y and z so it's it's not the perfect um it's not the perfect way all the time but i think that's what makes them so credible and such an amazing company is that they are truly open and transparent with everything they do um and so yeah that's very exciting and then obviously there is there are some things coming in the next six to twelve months that are very very exciting i can't talk to them i think um but yeah, designers' dreams are coming true. Sure, sure. I mean, uh, we are not in the business of breaking any NDAs, so I'm not going to to ask you about anything that's uh, up and coming and not yet public. Um, so another question I wanted to ask is concerning international transfers. Uh, typically, you would associate them with cumbersome processes, high costs, complicated pricing, long processing times, SEPA this, IBAN that. Uh, basically trying to figure out, because instead of just having one key uh, that you're putting in the lock, just like if I were doing a domestic transfer here, I have to input several items and I start worrying about are they the right ones. Is the money going to bounce back if I'm putting in the wrong items or is it just going to be sent somewhere into the world with no idea where it's actually reaching, if it's reaching the person that I want it to reach. So on the other hand, why is this known for its ease of use? transparency on the costs and those costs also being low just like you mentioned the mission to zero uh, right so what would you say is the secret behind the success of wise and what it takes to disrupt such services you mentioned that it's such a great company so i'm sure you have the way to back it up i mean that would be a great question for crystal our co-founder and ceo um but um i think the secret or or is that um, they created a company that truly serves a customer need. And it was time that this this industry gets shaken up a little bit um, because someone once set up these banking rules and then they were never questioned again. Um, and then comes Christo and Tavid, our two founders, uh, rethink having a specific need um of sending euros and and gbp to one another and how expensive that is and with the globalization and people moving everywhere i think borders are becoming so fluid everyone there's so many experts around i think they just really hit a nerve and it was really time to disrupt that sector um in in one specific way transfers and now it's obviously evolved as a product as well into an account and um, you can do many other things with with Wise nowadays, but I think yeah, the secret is just that they they kept their brand promise almost. They they stay true to their mission. Um, they're very honest in their communications, um, and and very they take good care of staying true to the real mission and not sort of <laughs> becoming corrupt or getting bored by other people and other ideas it's always very true to the mission everything we do we ask ourselves is that is that moving us one step closer to mission zero and i think people or customers see that as well when they when they interact with wise um it's a brand that stands for something and i think people 
um, prefer brands like that over brands that maybe have great marketing tricks but don't live up to their promise. Okay. I mean, yeah, you, you, uh, I, I agree with what you mentioned about uh, about why uh, I see it. Why is it like it's, uh, it has this aura of don't worry? You're using the backing system basically. And I wanted to flip this question from uh, from a product designer perspective because sending the larger the amount of money you send, the higher the stress factor. So you want to make sure that it gets safely to the correct receiver, but also you want to make sure that the user feels as as possibly as small boggled down with any details as possible so i'm wondering about the balance between the great ux which has to be as simple as possible but also making sure that all the check boxes are ticked right so uh also perhaps with some anti-fraud mechanisms being in place uh how do you maintain the balance between that and the product yeah I think you you just answered it yourself, I think. Because I I mean, great UX is always finding the most frictionless, easy to use visual solution for the customer while handling the most complex, secure backend system in the background to protect them, right? I think with especially with finance and security, I don't think you could make your way, tiptoe your way around a solution. Um, and then risking fraud or yeah, any security breach. Um, so a great product designer, it's difficult, but a great product designer dissects it until he has found the most easy to use solution and work with the technology and also push it, right? Sometimes you get presented, this is our technical solution. You have to work with it. But then maybe someone worked on that technical solution and didn't think about X, Y, and Z. And, and that's that's where why as a designer working in isolation is never a good idea because you have to work with other people together and find the solution together because you all come from different angles. And only together can you find that seamless um, customer solution. Yeah, so it sounds like break it down and then again and then again and then again. Yeah. Um, so we have some questions in the audience, um, uh, but still we, we do have some more of our original questions. So, um, this question concerns other banks. So many banks with international presence, for example, city are selling businesses in some of the markets, whilst new players like yourself, wise, you are expanding. And what would you say that is the reason for this generational switch, uh, other than just the neo bank and incumbent argument, mm -hmm. I think. Um, I mean, first of all, the big banks made it very easy for innovation or innovative companies to break through. Um, they've been very slow um, with that, and still are. Um, I think, in terms of growth, also, I guess the word of internet and social media and everyone sort of having access to information probably accelerated that um, you can find any information these days you don't have to believe what someone in front of you in the bank tells you to do you can google it yourself and make up your own opinions um, so i guess that that does play a big role in sort of the speed of of growth from from companies like wise um that once you have obviously if you have a great product and it works and and people can trust it it's trustworthy and established a little bit um then the internet definitely also social media plays a huge role in people educating themselves and word of mouth travel travels way faster these days than it used to be um you don't have to be in the same spot meeting a person using wise you can just find a hashtag and people talk about it. You go on Twitter and people talk about it or anywhere in forums, you just get way more information in a very short period of time. Um, so yeah, let's be thankful for slow bank growth. <laughs> I mean, slow bank growth is something I've heard, but the, the, the uh, 
marketing slash publicity argument is not something that is commonly heard. So, so thank you for this sort of new uh, new angle on the on the topic because that's that's very true. It, it's not just about the the features uh, and the, the speed, the velocity at which the product operates and changes, but also in the past, I imagine that the banks would be out of home displays, uh, ads on the TV. Whilst now it's a social media, not even just an ad, but sometimes even a post, right? An organic thing from a user saying, hey, I've had this great experience. I truly recommend it. And here's my referral, right? So uh, that's also something that I don't think it's frequently uh, mentioned as an argument in this uh, new bank versus, uh, versus incumbent uh, debate. Mm. So, of course, there's no episode about a fintech company without mentioning crypto, so please allow me. Uh, cryptocurrency advocates made many claims regarding the democratization of payments and new opportunities to address the challenges faced by the unbanked. So far, we have seen a slightly different face of the crypto world where speculation, high losses, high gains come to mind. What are your thoughts on crypto? And, of course, you're absolutely free to give me the... Uh, general uh, point of view but i'm also very keen and i want to make sure that we talk about the, the way we pay and send money so the wise uh, aspect of it all yeah i think uh, crypto crypto is just another side of financial literacy in my opinion it exists i think bitcoin exists since 2009 it's still around um it keeps evolving obviously it is not as stable as we're used to with maybe the bank, the traditional banking side of things and the traditional stock markets. Um, but it has massively evolved in, in again, in a very short period of time. If you think about it, 2009 till now, where it has come to, it has already been integrated sort of in the mainstream, especially in the last two years, I think it accelerated massively. So um, disruptive technology sort of is so much faster than what banks have built in the last couple of centuries, right? Um, so I think it's definitely here to stay in what way we don't know. And it depends what people do with this technology and what they build. But I think it's already part of our own. Um, and in terms of money transfers and sending money, it's already changed the way many people access money because I mean, the whole idea behind cryptocurrency is the democratization, right? And it's similar to why is it's, it's like, why, why do we have to pay so high fees that don't go anywhere other than into the bank's pocket and not to my benefit. So it's a similar, it's a similar user problem or approach, um, why does a banker decide over whether or not I get a mortgage higher than my neighbor's mortgage? You know, it's like outdated factors and cryptocurrency just gives access to so many more people in the world that don't have access because of someone writing these rules 60 years ago, right? So I think it's just another disruptor in the finance world and it's, it's good that it's here. It's just a question of what do we do with that technology? moving forward definitely uh beautiful closure to that to that answer uh we have some questions from the audience uh and i wanted to invite the audience to ask even more questions uh, this is a it's a free forum so um one question comes from Ginny. Mm -hmm. how can you develop yourself in a product organization good question i'm still figuring that one out <laughs> it's been only eight months um I think the values are a bit different in a product organization compared to an agency. Agency, it's often about the big projects, um, the big budgets, the great shiny ideas, um, also about great execution and, and value, because um, ultimately you need to provide value to customers so that clients um, stay as your client and don't just drop off. Um, but in product, I think you get more, the values are more around impact, creating impact for the end customer, um, but also for your own business that you're working for. So are you able to, 
to think about the right things because you can easily get lost as a designer in like micro improvements but they're not necessarily going anywhere so are you able to ask the right questions um is that the right thing to do should we tackle this or should we not rather think at the bigger picture and then go back down small again into and then chunk it up into smaller pieces so i think stay true to your craft so if you're a visual person definitely try and, and flex a little bit as well although that's sometimes difficult in product because uh, systems are already there but push the design quality all the time um but then learn the strategic side i think that's a big one um, but coming from an agency that that would be easier to learn i guess okay uh, the next one comes from uh, Zofia. She asks, compared to working at an agency, does the work keep being excited when just working on what product? If so, in what sense? How do you keep it the, the flame alive, basically? Yeah. yeah. Um, obviously, in um, product, I think for me, what was important is to join a company that has a really great, exciting real mission not just a marketing mission um, that's why i chose to start a wise as well because i believed in the mission i used the product before i started there because i also moved from a different country and had the same issue of bringing my money to that new country and um, so i already believed in the product um, and i love the brand and so i think that is the the motivator that you have when you go in-house it's just believing in what you're working for Whereas an agency, you sometimes don't really believe in what you're working for, but you can do something really cool still. Um, and then that's exciting. And you know that there's sort of the circle of in six months time, I do something else. Um, so that's the big differentiator, I would say. Okay. Mission. So this one comes, this one comes from Katarzyna and she asks, what is the process of implementing change in a product? For instance, when a product is used by a big audience like Facebook, there must be many steps taken before rolling out any change in the product. How do you test if a change is satisfactory or not? Uh, and I, I personally, I love to hear an in-depth answer to this question as much as you can uh, say, uh, not specific to WISE, but whatever you've seen uh, across the agency or, or at WISE. Yeah, depends on is if it's within an existing product, uh, so you're not launching a new feature, let's say, because that's, I think it's a whole different topic because that, that needs a lot of market research as well. Um, but let's say you stay within what you already have and you want to improve the experience. There's many things, but I guess it's, first of all, create a vision. What do you think is the right thing based on all the information that you have, the research that you have, um, the data that you have from people interacting with the product um, and then looking at that and seeing what can be improved and what already works really well. And then create sort of more a strategic vision of where you want to take things and then validate that. Um, we use usertesting.com a lot for quick validation, just create a prototype or static page, launch it, moderate it, unmoderate it, depends on how much time you have. And then see what happens in those sessions and then distill that and then see, okay, does that work? Does that not work? Improve, launch another test. It's very quick, especially the unmoderated ones. And then if you have enough confidence, you could already launch and then make decisions on, um, so if it's, it's, if it's native iOS or Android, usually we use one platform first and then launch to a specific audience, create A-B tests, monitor, and then you get data again, and then you look at that, and then did something improve? Great. Did it not? Or did it even get worse? Then obviously you have to ask some critical questions. Um, but yeah, usually that is sort of the the cycle, roughly. Okay. And uh, personally here, I'm curious, because usually what I've seen, for example, with, with Google Pay or with Facebook, that they would roll out a, a feature to, to a country, right? Um, I'm, I'm curious because with a country, there's so many things that might be specific to the geography. 
why is it the case that companies don't roll out it internationally but with smaller audience with more specific audiences as mm -hmm. in uh, instead of having just one vertical of country xyz why not try to put the eggs in many baskets of let's say 10 countries from varying regions to have like controlled variables of okay those are different countries but it's the same feature set available to a small subset of users yeah. why why is it the case or or is it the case uh, that i'm wrong and i'm just uh, not connecting the dots here no i think i'm i think at least in finance um there are so many things you have to consider and sometimes even roadblocks in some countries that it's just easier to launch and even in agency times we often launched something in one country or a specific region first and then launched in other regions just because okay. it gets too complicated to fit everything into one product um right at the start right so we launched we have a feature for assets so basically you can move your money into sort of an, a it's a it's not a stock but it's like some sort of bond package thing and it just auto invest your money we only launched that in the uk and we're planning to launch it in other markets as well but you need to just see if it works um, within one country. It's much easier to test what works, what doesn't work, rather than throwing in all the parameters of culture, of okay. legal changes. Um, that gets very messy. And then you don't really get a clear picture of does this product work in general, or is that just because governments throw things at us or is that just because it's a cultural change and people just don't are not used to a certain product in that region because that cultural obviously has a big big impact as well okay okay thanks i i i, I see the reasons now um ooh, the last audience question at least for now it seems is about your day-to-day -day responsibilities so what is the day at wise for rebecca like um day to day so i work in product discovery so that is everything um related to people finding out about wise and then funneling them into signing up with us and using us um so my day to day right now is uh, a lot of web relate signed up web related work uh, designing um getting a team together um sort of creating a lot of visual, pushing a bit the, the design standards as well, coming from agency, like big canvas and let's use the space and, and let's talk about our product and uh, the right way, because uh, WISE can definitely talk more and better about themselves. I think they're almost too humble as a company sometimes. Um, it is a great product and we're working to show that to people now and and hopefully soon that will launch and then other than that um if i'm not designing i'm meeting a bunch of people across the globe having awesome team events um yeah just having a great time okay yeah i mean uh, i uh, that's the one of the reasons when you mentioned that the company is too humble for why we're doing things like this so some more, some more publicity and reducing the humility factor. Um, so I have two more questions actually. So not the last one from the audience. Uh, Radek asks, what are your predictions for future trends? I imagine this is Radek means for the product design aspect, uh, not just the entire future. <laughs> um, good question. That's such a big question um putting me on the spot um i think well i don't know if it's a it's not a prediction necessarily but it's more a wish i okay. hope that agency and product the designer side merges more because i think they benefit from each other a lot and i think what product people can do like the the incremental and and the disruptive thinking and the innovation thinking is missing in agencies and then agencies are better at talking about the greatness of the product and product people can't do that often they it's very difficult to sometimes distill 
that complex product that you've been working on for 10 years and you know all the details about, but what's like the bird's eye view, one liner about a product. And I just hope that recruiters and teams and hiring managers, they change a little bit the, the narrative around, oh, we can't hire agency people because they don't have the experience. Of course they do. We're all designers and we all have to create products that work for the end customer, not just for a client. I, I really like that answer. Um, and we have a question that's very much aligned with what you just said. Now being outside the agencies, how are you feeling about working side by side with external teams inside a product oriented company? I imagine with like your wise, uh, not sure if you do work with external vendors, agencies, but for the sake of this question, let's assume you do. Uh, how, how have you seen that work? What are some things that people should keep in mind? We do work in certain areas only, not for the product design in itself. Um, we have our own teams. But I, yeah, as I just said, I think we shouldn't be so fixed about product people versus agency people. Um, we should just we should just um, learn from each other and bring these vast experiences together. And then you can create really powerful teams because as much as we need the Swiss Army knives that sort of can do a lot of things at the same time and have sort of that understanding, we also still need some specialists for some areas that are very, very good at a certain craft or whatever that may be, are very good at talking about the product. So selling visions, storytelling, emotional value, that type of stuff. Um, I think it's a mix that that's what makes great teams. Whenever I worked on really great teams, we always had a mix of those T-shaped creatives and some specialist creatives that were very good at, I don't know, 3D or, um, and then you merge all of these together and you, you end up creating a really powerful end product. So yeah, it's a similar answer actually to the previous question. I think we should just embrace that we all have different backgrounds, but it's good and not necessarily something we should block out. Just embrace it. Just embrace it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So thanks for that answer. And now leading up to our, our final question, which is in no way connected to product design or fintech. It's a question connected to you personally. It's the magic wand question. So mm -hmm. in the form of the Apple Pencil, I hand over to you the magic wand and I ask you if you could cast a spell that would make sure that every 12 year old in the world has been taught something, what would that something be? We've heard a plethora of answers from nothing leave the kids alone to financial prudence to uh, design thinking emotional intelligence there's no right answer it's just your answer so uh let's have it yeah there are many things i can think of but i think one thing that that um sort of was on my personal journey in the last two years and i'm not saying that because i work at wise today it has been it started a bit earlier is financial literacy i think we do not learn anything about finances in our school system today, at least not in my school system. Um, and I mean, I don't mean how to file a tax report, although that's handy. Um, I don't think that's financial literacy. It's more understand how the finance world works, what makes it work in their favor. Um, and then sort of also that critical thinking, right? uh don't just believe what the banker tells you what are ways you can make your money work for you um even with little money i think it's also a lot of the narrative in our society is like once you have money it's very easy to make more money out of that money but what if you don't have money how do you start it's impossible and it's it takes so long it's such a tedious journey to understand and obviously it's also very difficult because you're playing with your money eventually and you might lose a lot of money. So um, yeah, fun, how to become more financial literate, have have that in school and learn as a small child. I think it's easier to also to lose a fear of something because once you're grown up and you earn money and you're sort of in that spiral, then it's like, oh my God, I'm not going to put, like, what am I going to do with my money? I can't move. And yeah, I think that that would be my thing. 
Yeah, yeah, I completely agree that the schools have uh, quite a bit to pick up on. And uh, but I do disagree that the tax filing report that's just the basics that are still missing. Yeah. So even before yeah. you start understanding the concept of money itself, compound interest, all of that, making sure that you uh, protect the downside, so to say, because if you don't file your taxes or file them incorrectly, well, somebody's going to knock on your door eventually. Um, so, so yeah, definitely some slack to be picked up by by schools, but but also parents. Also, parents could do a better job of uh, not uh, not scaring their kids, I suppose, because what you mentioned yeah. is very important. It's not just the knowledge building, but also embracing that you don't have to. Money is a very emotional thing, especially yeah. when it comes running out, right? When you're like closer to the end of the month and the bank account is looking mighty empty, something that many students, for example. Uh, encounter and it's good to sort of understand and remove the emotionality of it all as much as one can uh, to make sure that fear is never the driver in your decisions even when you do have money right yeah so that being said uh, Rebecca thank you so much for today's answers uh, and the wisdom that you've shared thank you dear audience for the questions and your presence uh, and otherwise everybody please Go check out our Spotify and uh, Apple Podcasts channels because that's where you have all of the episodes. This one coming right up as well. Um, and what else there's to say? See you next Tuesday on the following episode of Disruption Talks and every other live stream that you might encounter from NetGuru. So, Rebecca, once again, thank you so much and see you around. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye. It's been a pleasure.